You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here is your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Well, it's Wednesday, a couple weeks till Christmas, and I am Glenn <laughs> the Geek from Ocala, Florida. And I'm Jamie Jennings, and I'm in Norman, Oklahoma. You're listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for Wednesday, December 13th, episode 3322. Good morning, horse people. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We have Emily's joining us from the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance to talk about the work that they do. And uh, Jamie has a little experience with them. And Jane from Equiculture.net is joining us to talk about, I asked for this one, by the way, to talk about the importance <laughs> of dung beetles. Cause, I can't believe you asked for an well, interview about horse poo and bugs in it. It's poo week, because Monday we talked about horse poo and picking it up, and then it reminded me of dung beetles, and I've always wondered how the heck they know the piles are even there. Um, so she apparently is, I don't know, they wrote an article on the importance of dung beetles. So Ashley, we have another one coming from England. We're getting very international this week. <laughs> and, and then in the Auditor Post Show, we're going to talk about the 18 things to never say to a woman. And we're going to find out if Jamie's had them said and whether I've said them. Gonna, if you probably yeah. said them all. Yeah, I probably have at one point <laughs> or another. Um, and it's Happy National Horse Day. Yes, it is National Horse Day in the United States. It, this was started in 2004. Congress designated December 13th as National Horse Day. Money now, well spent, Congress. <laughs> now, I will say that for you and I, pretty much every day is National Horse Day. I was going to say, that's why it's money well spent, because like literally every day is Horse Day. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, for at least us. <laughs> $9.2 billion is what they estimate uh, horses generate in the economy, and that's just uh, that's just Jamie's house. Um, and seven, right as of the last census, there'll be another one this year. They did a census this year. We'll have new numbers. But as of the last census, uh, 7.2 million horses were located in the United States. Um, and the top states are probably what you would think the top states for the number of horses would be. And Texas, California, Florida, and Kentucky. No, Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. Oklahoma's number four. Texas came in at 760,000. California at 535,000. Florida at 387. I actually thought hot Florida would be higher than that. And Oklahoma at... 87 horses? 387,000. <laughs> Okay. Um, and in Oklahoma, 252,000, of which about 52,000 are at Jamie's house. Uh, so, <laughs> so. Thinking I'm helping. I'm yeah. helping. You're helping the economy. Uh, but I was surprised, actually, with Oklahoma number four. Do you drive around and see a lot of horses everywhere? Um. It, yeah, I mean, there is. Uh, so in the little, like, there's some cities, but right outside, it is so rural outside the towns. And there are some major quarter horse breeding operations uh, here yeah, and was... a lot of reset mare places. And apparently the whole business of reset mares is ginormous here. So huh. yeah, lots of, lots of horses. Who knew? Well, the people who keep track of uh, national days say that you should do these things to celebrate uh, national horse day. Go for a horseback ride. I think you can all accomplish Check. that one. Yeah. Yeah. Watch a horse movie. And by the way, they recommend Sea Biscuit, Black Beauty, and National Velvet. Uh, that was the three they put in there. And donate to an equine charity. All of those sound like something we could all do and probably do all the time. So, so there you go. But that happy National Horse Day, everybody! Yay! <laughs> Well, happy birthday to auditors Melly Hernandez and Caitlin Kennedy. Happy birthday to both of you. We hope you have a terrific day. Well, Glenn, I am taking a road trip today. 
There you right go. after the show, I am going to go down to Texas to look at a horse. You're going to buy one of the uh, 760,000 horses in Texas? Here's the really good news. <laughs> I'm looking at it for somebody else. Oh, good. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So my friend Larissa is going to look at a horse and she's asked me to come with her. So we're going to hop in the car, do a little Thelma and Louise trip down to Texas, look at a horse and come back tomorrow. But it's it's about probably about four hour drive. So we're not going that far, but it's going to be fun. And what's really cool is Larissa has gone with me on several horse trips and kind of the deal is I'm like, if you come with me, I'll pay for everything. I'll pay for the hotel. I'll pay for all the gas. I'll pay. I I just pay for meals, everything. So for the first time I get to be the passenger Ah, and I get to order whatever. You have to do all the driving either. Uh, no, I just get to go. It's going to be really, really fun. Hey, I did find a story of good news and this is crazy. This is crazy. Um, so It came to me in weird news, but I just thought it was worth celebrating because you love to do lottery stories. And this is similar. So there's a the the Ritz Carlton in Paris. I just saw a a YouTube video on that, actually. The Ritz Carlton? Yeah, it's very fancy. Well, they called down to the front. She's like, oh, my God. God, I've lost my... I was really just a chance to do rich people voices. <laughs> I've lost my diamond ring. I can't find it anywhere. And that's definitely not a French accent. I'm assuming it's somebody who sounds like me. Uh, I've lost my diamond ring. I can't find it anywhere. And, and and say I called the front desk and you were answering the phone on the front desk. So mm-hmm. respond to that. Oh, I, I would say, well, if we if we come across it, we'll let you know. No, I need to find it now. It, 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 I have to have it. I need help. Okay, we'll send the butler up. I need more than the butler. <laughs> you don't understand this ring. This ring, I need to have it. Okay, I'll send two butlers up. More! <laughs> we need more! The diamond ring has vanished from my room. All right, I'll call the cleaning crew and see if anybody there found it and hasn't pawned it yet. Okay, well, um, they didn't find it, and so oh. they got the whole. St- now, now here's the question: I thought you would ask me, oh. why is this? Yeah, here you're gonna ask me this. Okay, why is this ring so important? Why is this ring so important to you, ma'am? Oh my God, it's worth so much money. And how much is it worth, ma'am? <laughs> this woman oh. lost a diamond ring that was on her finger that was worth eight hundred. Thousand oh dollars. That's a big diamond. <laughs> We're gonna need everybody to yeah, come and find yeah. it. Okay, I'll send the whole cleaning crew up. <laughs> that's like think about it, like, and that's security. like a million million dollars. Okay, you just lost a, almost a million dollars. And so what they did is they had all of the cleaning crew, all of the employees, everything. It was a Malaysian guest. Okay, so I don't know how Malaysian accents go, so I'm gonna go with mine. Um, and so they send everybody out. They're tearing up her room. They're tearing apart everything. And did the whole he, ring fall off or just the diamond? The whole ring. Oh, okay. She lost the whole ring. So maybe because it's so ginormous, she can't sleep with it, put it next to the nightstand. And somehow it disappeared off the nightstand. Do you know where they found it? No. <laughs> Ma'am, we, we found your ring. Oh, good. Where was it? Um... It was, it's going to need to be cleaned. It's a little dusty. They actually, they searched so hard. They found it inside a vacuum cleaner bag, which means somebody went to all the vacuums and cut open all the bags and sifted through the bags. God, Um, you, you know how when you pick up a coin, it goes clunk, 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 clunk in your vacuum. You think a ring that size would go clunk, clunk, clunk. Yeah, you would think so. Anyway, so, so I would like to give a second daily Winnie to the poor hotel person who was going through the vacuum cleaner bags and then found it. And and there's no word on whether they gave her or him a tip or extra money or anything. The only thing that they say in this statement is that the hotel says, our client is very happy at the news that they found it. <laughs> like, yeah, she should be. <laughs> Idiot. Anyway. How comfortable, how rich do you have to be to feel comfortable wearing an $800,000 ring on your finger? I mean, 
She's people, not gonna feel thieves comfortable would at cut all. your finger off for that. Yeah. 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 Imagine walking around with it. I wouldn't even walk around with a fake eight hundred thousand you know, yeah. ring that looks like that for fear of somebody wanting wanting it off my finger. That's crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. Hey, I don't know if I, I I know I mentioned this in the Zoom call the other night. And by the way, thank you for joining us. But uh, I, I mentioned that we got approved. Uh, the county has approved our barn permit finally. Yay! So now tomorrow we have to go to the county office and pay the other $400. So th- it's a total of $500 for a permit to build the barn with the county. The house will be three to $4,000 for the permit. This okay. is a rinky-dink little county in the middle of Florida. I mean, they got to make their money somehow. Well, so, yeah. But, I mean, how did they even come out and look at your property to like nope. check nope. it out? Nothing. Nope. Just like pay nope. money to get a nope. piece of paper. Yep, exactly. <sighs> oh, by the way, you have to pay another permit fee for the sewer and another one for the well, too. So, Oh, this yeah. is so fun. Yeah. <laughs> I figure it's going to be about $5,000 in permits by the time we're done. Wow. Uh, yeah. And just, there are fun. people listening to that sneezing, uh, like, because that is nothing. I know. Um, that probably in California would be 30000 right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, or you wouldn't get it. Yeah, that's true. But I'm just glad. It took seven weeks. We're glad it's done. We can finally tell the barn people to... Put us on the schedule. So Awesome. Hey, uh, don't forget also that uh, if you use the coupon code HRN at statelinetech.com, uh, there's a discount on qualifying products over there. Jennifer, by the way, I got we got a big box in last week from statelinetech.com. And in it were three new saddle pads. So Jennifer went saddle pad I, shopping. I'm, no, she didn't. They no. they actually throw those in ah, um, oh, they're for free. free. Oh, okay. yeah. They're... So when Jennifer gets a big package and there's there's saddle pads in it. Just know it was like it was like if you buy this tiny little cheap bag of cookies, we'll throw in three saddle pads. I didn't know that. That's good yeah, to know. Yeah, I know. I have to tell husbands that all the time, <laughs> especially mine. I'm like, listen, here's the thing is I bought this like $4 item that I really, really needed. And they just threw all that stuff in the box. I didn't even know it was coming. <laughs> it's, they're so nice and stay on deck. I wonder how many orders they ship out at Christmas time. It's kind of be crazy. Well, I just got a package from Stateline Town. Uh huh. Were there, were there three f- free saddle pads in it? Yeah, you know bonus? what, Glenn? It's so funny you say that because what happened was I just <laughs> ordered some stud muffins and they sent two horse blankets. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I read an article this morning, totally off topic, about podcasting and how some companies are finding a ways to avoid the ads, you know, specific ads, if they, they can find them in the podcast and then they'll skip them. You could never skip our ads. <laughs> No, <laughs> can't get around it. You can't even tell it's an ad. Statelinetech.com. Use coupon code HRN till the end of the year. Let's go to I our first guest. I would like to do, wait, hold on, do yeah. the disclaimer of like, Stateline Tech does not actually send in free items to, to, when you order <laughs> yes, it. You have to pay right. for all the items that you get. That's all made there up. There you go. There you go. I did it. Okay, yeah, I kind of believe that Jennifer did pay for him in some no, way. No, she shape. didn't, Glenn. Oh, she okay. didn't. I told right. you. It was free. They just right. throw tack in the box. She forgot to use that line, by the way. Way, Sometimes whatever. you don't even order stuff and just boxes of tags show up at your house. That's happening to a lot of the auditors right now with their uh, Christmas, what is it, Secret Santa uh, presents showing up. Yeah. Did you, get, you got yours already, right? I did not get mine, but I, the person I sent it to did get it. Oh, good. Okay, good. And I mean, am I a Scrooge? I'm like, if you do Secret Santa, I know it's supposed to be a secret, but like at the end, I want it to know who sent me this. Oh, I do too. I don't want it. I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I don't like surprises or secrets. <laughs> Let's just all be honest with oh, each other. Oh, yeah, okay? we know that. <laughs> I know that. All mm-hmm. right, coming up next, we're going to Emily, who is uh, who works with the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. We're going to talk a little bit about what they, we haven't had them on, I think, in a long time. Uh, talk about what they do, and they're doing a 2023 holiday giving campaign, and they're doing they're this awesome cool... and very important to me. So I'm excited they're on. Well, what caught my attention was uh, they're doing this match thing that every day a person of some renowned matches whatever's donated that day. And the other day it was Donna Brothers, who we've talked to and had on the show and met. Uh, so it just caught my attention. I thought, well, we haven't talked about them in a while, and I forgot you had personal experience with them. So uh, we're going to get her on and chat about that. Well, I would like to welcome Stacy to the show. Thank you, Stacy, for joining us to talk about one thing that is 
I mean, it's probably the most important thing to me in my life is is rehoming thoroughbreds. Um, and I'm so excited to talk to somebody from the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance because y'all have been very instrumental in helping us and helping a rescue I'm associated with. And uh, I appreciate it. So first of all, hello. How are you? I'm good. And thanks so much for having me on the show. This is great. Well, tell everybody where in the world you are right now. Uh, we are based out of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, the Thurbert Aftercare Alliance is uh, 86 accredited groups across North America. Our home office and where we do all the busy work is um, in Lexington, Kentucky. So we're here now, busy writing Christmas cards, uh, sending thank you <laughs> notes out, doing all that stuff. Awesome. Well, tell everybody, um, we haven't talked about you guys in a while, so tell everybody what the TAA is and does. Uh, the Thurbert Aftercare Alliance is an industry initiative. So in that, by that meaning, uh, you know, in 2011, a lot of industry people got together, including the founding partners, the Breeders' Cup, Keeneland, the Jockey Club, um, and said, you know, we have to do something about making sure that these horses are going to good places after racing, that those places are have, a, a, have some sort of seal of approval. So that's our accreditation. And then we have to try and help them raise some funding to take care of the horses. Um, it's a very expensive, as you probably know, to rehome and retrain thoroughbreds um, after racing or breeding careers are finished. Um, so we try and alleviate some of that pain for fundraising for some of our groups and um, we fundraise for them to get them some some breathing room and to help get them a network that they can work with other groups and maybe they're timid to talk to racetracks and stuff like that. So we sort of try to bridge the gap between horse racing and breeding and um, what happens to horses after racing. As you know, most racehorses um, only race until they're five or six years old at the very most. And then 75% of their life is after um, those years are over. So we try and help them have a soft landing. A personal note, how many thoroughbreds do you own? I own I own two. I, I unfortunately had to let one go that was 24 years old due to illnesses um, last week. I own two oh, thoroughbreds myself and a um, and a, a friendly donkey. <laughs> I swear, Glenn, if I worked for the TAA, because oh, you're looking at these things all day, I would have nine hundred. You'd have a thousand. You already have a thousand. You'd have two thousand. <laughs> yeah, Listen. no, it, it's dangerous for sure. Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm sure. So yeah. So one of the things. So I I'm here in Oklahoma. And I restart a lot of the horses for Horse and Hound up in Guthrie, Oklahoma, the Horse and Hound Rescue mm -hmm. Foundation. And yeah. one of the really big deals was when she got her TAA accreditation. Uh, sure. It is, I mean, it is like it's putting the seal of approval, a stamp on it. Tell, tell us why that certification is so important and why, if you're dealing with an organization that's not, you should be careful. Uh, yeah, I think that was the sort of the impetus of starting the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. There was some concern of where some horses were ending up and what was happening to them. Unfortunately, um, not all charities are, are, are run like successful businesses. So the idea was to find a way to do a, be like a better business bureau sort of stamp of approval on organizations that were taking care of horses after racing and breeding. And uh, we came up with a plan um, with the committees and, and the board and a lot of governance, a lot of strategizing for the first two years. And the accreditation process is an all year thing. It starts in January when we release the application. And last week we sent out the checks. So that's a full year. Um, we're already getting vamp ramped up with some mentorship calls for groups that didn't get it um, and helping them maybe get in the application process again next year. Part of that application process and why it is such a big deal um, is because we do a due diligence on their horse health care, their financials, their governance, their 501c status, their business practices. And, you know, their succession plans, their euthanasia policy. So all of these things, the application, as we've been told, um, but the groups seem to get through it, is a beast. And, um, <laughs> yes, it is. But, but then we've also been told that it made our organizations better groups. Um, they thought they were good. And then having to consolidate their financials, their the governance, their everything together and really think about some uh, recommendations that we make for improvement, um, they have become more aligned and, and, and I think more successful in their own um, adoption policies and their own adoption successes and their own uh, fundraising due, due diligence and all that. 
you had uh, Jamie very nervous before you guys came out. I think she thought she was taking like the SATs or something. And oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael Blowen, uh, he's from old friends here in in Lexington, and he coined the phrase early on. I've been audited by the IRS, and it was easier than the TA application. <laughs> Although I think that's a bit harsh, but um, but he but he does admit that it made old friends a better group, and um, you know a more a more optical group. You know, I think when you get the TA approval and you're accredited by the TA, it goes without saying that we are in contact with the organizations at least four or five times a year, even when they're accredited. We ask for follow up on their inventory. We ask for follow up on their on their um, on their finances every year. And then there's an open door for uh, a confidential complaint form. So if there's someone that, you know, says, oh, this group has got this problem, we will confidentially look into it. And Mm -hmm. I would say nine times out of 10, it's not a big deal. We managed to solve it. It's a misunderstanding. And those sort of, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are, wouldn't be reflected on or looked at, um, in in aftercare if we didn't have this open communication so for that reason it's good it feels inclusive <clears throat> for the groups they feel like they're part of the bigger picture of horse racing and breeding that sounds really familiar what she's talking about glenn i know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so i got inspected because i was working with the rescue as training i mean so just even mm-hmm. the the arms that outreach from y'all uh to mm-hmm. make sure all these horses are healthy happy and safe uh is is huge and that's why yeah. i do tell people like make sure you look for that stamp from the taa because that means you're going somewhere that's doing things right you know they're doing Doing all the things right. Yeah, the horses are all in an inventory, and we're recently in a relationship with HISA in that um, our organizations are on the on the list of places horses can be exited to, most of our organizations. Um, and so that is also for the horse. So let's say you had a horse, it was ra- it was racing in Oaklawn, and then you wanted to retire it, and you said, okay, I'm going to send it to Horse and Hound. In the portal, you would transfer it to Horse and Hound, and all of that horse's vet records ideally we'll go to horse and hound and that's a that's a game changer for a lot of organizations it was a mm-hmm. guessing game like i think he's got an ankle i don't know if i want to spend 200 dollars in x-rays oh look there's an ankle um we already know the most of the horse's history now it comes with the horse and so ha- that is a, you know that's a pretty great relationship um and it's good information for the organizations and there's good communication i think we've not eliminated, but we've been able to lessen the amount of competition between organizations. And so that we are all in this together, we try and have an organization's call once a month in which, you know, we step out of quite often, but it's led by um, Bev Strauss from Mid-Atlantic Thoroughbred. She's our organization's committee chair. And so there is good communication and networking and understanding. And I think if you're a horse owner, like to your point, Jamie, you want to send your horse where you feel good about it. You don't want to be staying up at night going, was that the right person? Did they have a trailer in the backyard? Like what's going on? So um, we try and keep it as open communication as we can. We're aware of the adoption policies and contracts for our groups. um, If we think they need a better one and we make a recommendation, but for the most part at this point of the, you know, when we have 86 groups that are accredited across the country, uh, with two in Canada, um, that is really the best due diligence we can do for our horses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is really important. So uh, you're running a holiday campaign. Uh, tell mm-hmm. us about that. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, ideally it would be great if we had, when the TA started, we were supposed to have sustainable funding from a touch point in the thoroughbred's life everywhere. And, and we don't have as much as we had hoped for or anticipated. We do have some. Um, the Jockey Club raises quite a bit of money through the reported mare spread fee and um, the registration fee. The sales contribute um, automatically on the on the seller and um, and uh, opt out on the buyer. Some racetracks contribute on per start. So we do have some of those things, but we did realize that the demand for funding was greater and we've started to do different campaigns. So last year we started the holiday giving campaign was Emily Dresden's brainchild. And um, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And we had 14 last year, people say, okay, I'll make a, I'll make a donation for a thousand dollars or 500 or $5,000. 
and you can use my name and we'll try and get people to match it. This year, we've got a full month of December. So that's been fun. Um, different people. It's a surprise every day who the person will be. It's uh, revealed in the morning. If you're on Emily's email list, you'll get it at six. Otherwise, you can follow us on social media. And then that reveal is sort of, you know, um, we'll use my husband, for example. Mike Rogers donated $500 to kick off the campaign. And then I madly email all his friends and family and go, hey, you know, you're thinking of Christmas. So we kind of want to inspire people to do that with their campaign. Um, last year, we had uh, Joe DeFrancis match Bob Baffert's uh, $10,000 because he's like, I want to make sure he has to pay. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> and, you know, and they're good friends. And so it's all in good fun. But it is sort of connecting people and identifying. And then every, you know, because these are all of our horses in this industry and we are all benefiting from this sentient being, it's really wonderful to kind of connect people to their connections. So you may not, um, you know, we may not get anything from Aunt Betsy, but because Aunt Betsy's related to one of our donors, she's like, oh, I'm going to send to match for this contributor. So it's great to connect people into their own little network of people. And maybe it also expands awareness. It's a good fun reveal every day. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, it raises two things, funding for the organizations, which we desperately always need. We're, um, it, the large, we seem to be growing exponentially more with organizations than we are with funding. And then it also raises a lot of awareness and um, it's a fun Christmas sort of spirit in the spirit of things to do. Awesome. Well, uh, Stacy, where can people go to like to donate or to be, become a part of it? Yeah. The easiest thing is to direct people to our website, which is the www.thoroughbredaftercare.org. Um, and we have um, a donate page there, ways to give. Uh, we will take phone calls. Uh, we can, you can reach our office um, or you can mail in something on your own. Our, our address uh, is 821 Corporate Drive in Lexington, uh, the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. So depending if you, you know, you're somebody that wants to do it on your phone, in the app or on, on the website, or you just want to mail in an old fashioned check, um, that's great too. And uh, we try and make it really easy for people. And if anyone is frustrated by technology and all of those things <laughs> and wants to make a phone call, we'll take a phone call. So there, you know, we're, we're not close to, uh, you know, any of those options. We want to help people uh, feel good about what they're doing. And, you know, it's, we like the conversations. We encourage people to go and check out the organizations in their home state, wherever they are, if they happen to travel to, you know, some of the bigger racing states, there's some fantastic organizations to love to share um, you know, their experiences and, and their horses and what's happening and what they do. It's very important to have a, you know, a sustainable plan for our, our, our commodity, which is the racehorse, um, not only for because we care about the animals so much and we want them to be to land softly, also for our sport and our industry. Um, mm -hmm. This is, you know, we can't not do the right thing. In this day and age, this generation is going to make us um you know, we're going to be held accountable for what we do um, as we are with water and, and climate change and all these other issues that we have uh, in society. But being accountable for that and being responsible for that the holiday season is a really good time to, you know, get that out before the tax year ends and um, also uh, feel good about something in, in, the, in this special time of year. Wonderful. I texted Nelda Kettles, who runs Horse and Hound, and I was like, hey, any words about the TAA? I'm going to have Stacy on. And she said that um, they they get most of the funding from you guys, which is super important. And that, the, the, yes, everybody goes through a very rigorous inspection every yeah. year. And also that you guys do a lot of good PR for the accredited rescue. So thank you for that. And that... Um, it's not about numbers. It's better, more about good homes for the horses and all of yeah. those things are important. And, and I just want to thank you guys for what you do. Yeah, no worries. And look, it, I, I think it's great that it's been embraced by the larger entities, the Breeders' Cup yeah. being able to yeah. showcase it there and, and all those things. So it is an industry initiative. That's where we started. That's how it's going to be. I always tell everyone we're just the Uber drivers. And the industry has to decide what they want to go. I can picture the thoroughbred sticking out of the back window. <laughs> <laughs> where do we want to go with this, everybody? Yeah. So give us direction. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, guys. Thoroughbred Happy holidays. Caroline. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. That You had a very personal connection to that whole story. 
I did. I did. And when she talked about how if people think there's something wrong, they can contact them and then they'll sick, you know, their people on you to make sure you're not doing anything wrong. That's the story of the person who said, oh, there's a horse that's skinny and it, it's like a horse is like really sick and we're working on trying to get it better. And they've reported me for having that horse. And so the TAA came out and did like this insane inspection, like looking at my feet, looking at the my, how what medical things. They Couldn't went they all just my look at the $55,000 worth of Kentucky Performance Products bottles in your tack room? <laughs> I know, right? I know, right? <laughs> but like, and and obviously I clearly passed and everything was fine. But as, I mean, as torturous as that social media onslaught was for me to get, I'm glad that at least there is a way that if one of these organizations aren't doing what they're doing, that it's supposed to be doing, that you can reach out. It just sucked that it was the way that the threatening phone calls and terrible people that attacked me. <laughs> but, but that not being said, it's... But now you're clear. You're in the, clear. You're in. Uh, she was great. I love talking to her, and I love that she has that kind of passion for her mission too. So. I just I'm talking to her. I was like, she's got a bunch of thoroughbreds. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you just like, knew how it. Could you not? Yeah. How could you not? I know. And then, of course, of course, one just passed away last week, which is our oh. luck when we ask those kind of questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go to our next guest. Let's head to England, and we're going to change gears totally. And we're going to talk about what comes out of the thoroughbreds. Poop bugs. And who helps us clean them up. And that's the dung beetles. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I am bringing the quality entertainment to this show. Only You only get it on horses horses in the morning. You know, I I brought us the quality poop picking entertainment on Monday. You obviously are slacking because I'm doing all the work here. You're right. You're right. I'm worthless. (laughs) I'll go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're going to get uh, Jane Myers on. She's from a website called equaculture.net. Unfortunately, we were not able to get through to England. Uh, we both tried uh, both directions, and apparently somebody cut the cables. I don't know. Uh, so, but, and you really wanted to talk I about did. dung beetles. But I ha- to be fair, I wasn't that excited about I had it, my so. heart set on dung beetles. Uh, <laughs> I actually did some research on dung beetles. I've watched dung beetles my entire career as a horse husband, and I always wondered, my biggest question was, the horse poops, and with 10 minutes, that beetle pops out of the ground. How does he know? How it, does he know? Does he smell it? Does he? Well, anyway, we're going to try and figure this technology thing out, and we'll get Jane on another time. But uh, we just cannot. We tried every which way to get connected today, and for some reason, the phones were not cooperating between here this and is England. What so, happens when you do it as live? Like, uh, so we, or we do the this Beatles in order ate the as lines. live. The Beatle yeah. got in there and ate the lines. That could be it, too. I'm not sure. Probably. But, sure. but we do this as live, and you know, you get what you get. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you, everybody, for putting up with us. This uh, se- this segment that we didn't have was brought to you by Daily Dose Equine, and we're going to hear from them <laughs> right now. And then we're going to. Do you have weird news? Do we have to call anybody uh, for that? Or? We might have a little weird news. All right, we'll do that because we don't have to call anybody, so we're safe. All right. I'm here with the mad scientist who developed Daily Dose Equine horse feeds, Janet Geyer, and I wanted to have a quick chat with you because Daily Dose Equine horse feed are non-GMO whole food nutrition based. And a lot of people go, oh, that comes from a small dedicated feed mill. I won't be able to get that when I travel. They're wrong, aren't they? They are. You can get it through Chewy anywhere in the United States. Or if you live locally in Maryland and Northern Virginia, you can get it delivered. There you go. Chewy.com. It will deliver it anywhere you want. You can also schedule delivery in advance so you can have it delivered every X number of days. And you can go in there to your account and change it every time you move horse show venues. So check it out today, dailydoseequine.com online or chewy.com. Time to learn why some days you're embarrassed to be part of the human race in Jamie's Weird News. Well, I wouldn't go that far this time. I, I I wouldn't say you could be embarrassed to be part of the human race. Just be embarrassed to be a part of Florida. <laughs> and uh, somebody <laughs> lives in Florida. I right think our listeners me. target Florida knowing I live here. I mean, it, you know, you can't make it up. So it's going on whether you like it or not. Targeted or Maybe not. Maybe we just publish it more and so they're easier to find. 
You keep saying that, but I'm just going to go with, no, that's not how this works. Um, I'm going to take a picture of this first before I get into everything. I'm going to take a picture of this first story, the picture from the story, and then you'll be able to see what I'm talking about Okay. because it's important that you understand what I'm going to say. Okay. So first of all, if you're ever looking for news and you're in your news aggregator or whatever, and you're like, oh, that story is super weird, email it to me, jamie at horseradionetwork.com with weird news in the subject line. And I will tell I won't tell who's who, mainly because I'm not that organized, but also because nobody needs to know your business and where you're looking at stuff. Cause some of y'all send me some really oh, inappropriate. You no, know I stuff. hate those pictures. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, anyway, I want to thank April, <laughs> Delia, Laurie, Laureen, Jessica, Eileen, Jolyn, Ina, Allie, Stephanie, Claire, Rochelle, and Danielle all send me weird news. And then oh I'm going to tell you about this first story, which I know Glenn loves. Just <laughs> oh my God. so this guy named Mike. I would jump off on- a bridge. <laughs> Well, here's here's this is where the the Florida man, you're not from Florida because you would not have the reaction that the person in this story had. Okay. So, Mike is on his way to dinner with his son and they are walking, I guess they're walking down the street and they're in the Big Cypress National Preserve and they're heading to dinner. Yeah, that's towards the Everglades, I think. Yeah. yeah. And they um they notice <laughs> That there's a guy working hard and then two other guys just kind of standing around. What is the guy working hard on? So so they have like an abundance of pythons oh, in the problem. Everglades. It's eating that are like not most of the animals. There. They're like, yeah. they've eaten 80% of the little animals in the Everglades. Well, I'm going to tell you about a story that the one actually did eat 80% <laughs> because um, there's so many aspects to this story. And the first one is this guy is like walking down the street to dinner and he sees this one guy that's wrestling a snake and there's two guys watching. And um, so what do you think if you saw a guy wrestling a Python, because they, they, they freely ask you to, to dispatch. Yeah. These oh, you're allowed because, to do anything you want with pythons. Yeah. They're a big problem. And so, um, if Glenn, you were walking down the street and you saw somebody wrestling a snake, what would you do? I, I would leave the immediate area immediately. Yes. Well, Mike did not. Mike decided <laughs> to step in and help. Oh, uh, is that what you yeah, do? So he's walking down the street with his kid and he's like, hey, that guy's wrestling a snake. I better help out. And so him, actually his son jumped on it. And the two guys that were standing around watching and the one guy who was already working at it. Okay. And the son looked to be about 15 years old. Okay. So he's not like a tiny little kid. So they end up jumping on this snake. The, he says, the five of us got on top of this thing and it literally lifted us off the ground, like off the ground. This was a 17 foot long python he said we literally put all of our weight on the snake and we sat on it and the snake pushed back and lifted us right off the ground to the point where where we had to rebalance ourselves to even regain control and do you know how much this snake weighed 198 pounds <laughs> you said the picture there's seven like five or six people holding it and it's longer than the five or six. it's huge enormous thing did- there's five men holding it, and the men on each end are also holding their arms out to hold the tail and the head. So they wrestle this 500-pound python. I guess they dispatch it. But here's the big shocker, and not really a shocker. This is the second biggest one ever caught in Florida. Not the biggest, but the second biggest. This snake is so massive that they're wrapping it around their body, like holding it, and their knees are buckling under the weight of this snake. There is no way I'm getting anywhere close to that without a shotgun in my hand. There's just no way. Hey, hold my beer. (laughs) I got to jump in and help. There's Um, no way. (laughs) When they opened the snake up, guess what they found inside the snake? About 25 dead animals, dogs, cats. Freaking deer, Glenn. A deer. It caught a deer. (laughs) Jeez. You know what? I'm not going down there. Y'all can screw that. You know what? I'm never going to the Everglades. I'll just look at pictures. Have you ever driven through? 
No. There's a highway no. that goes right through the Everglades. It take it goes from East Coast to Florida to the West Coast, and that's the only highway. This is where you have to go. Uh, and it's called Alligator Alley for a reason, because you're driving along and there's nothing. It's flat as could be, and it's all just swamp land on either side of the highway. Uh, but that you'll see all the alligators just sitting around on the on the, beside the road the whole way. You just you'll see a hundred alligators and two hundred well, alligators on your way through. It's crazy. Well, well, Mike had some concerns, <laughs> and he went on to say, "Quote." I'll walk through these swamps in the dark to get to my tree stand in the morning before the sun comes up to be able to watch the woods come to life. And knowing that a snake snake that big could be like standing next to me or above your head (laughs) could be. Well, they don't stand. No, they climb those trees and they come down from the top. And then he's standing next to me and then I'd never even know it. And like, how many times have I walked by there? They let me go by because I wasn't the meal that they wanted. When is some little kid going to walk by there? And how many more deer are going to walk by there? <laughs> They're getting his deer, Glenn. They're getting his deer. See, this is so. why Florida is an open carry state. It isn't for people. It's for <laughs> 17-foot snakes. <laughs> okay. Next story. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Florida Joker? No. Okay, well, apparently he's, like, famous. He's a 35-year-old man named Lawrence Patrick Sullivan. And he is a South Florida tattoo model. And he went viral. Wait, wait, a, minute, wait a minute. He just gets mm-hmm. tattoos and then models them? Is that... <laughs> I've never heard of a tattoo a model before. I job market for a tattoo model, but apparently... He went viral when he was arrested and had his mugshot taken, and he went viral because he resembles um, the villain loosely based on Heath Ledger's portrayal as the Joker. Okay, so this dude is in the orange jumpsuit in his mugshot, and he's got, like, the the scarring tattooed along his face he's got like his whole face is tattooed his hair is dyed bright green he's got like a bat at the top of his forehead and then on the other side is this joker this guy committed to the batman franchise he's got a cross underneath his eye he's got a teardrop coming out his other eye his entire like where you know we try to avoid dark circles under our eyes he tattooed like big black circles around his eyes i mean he looks like the joker right Well, here's what happened. He's mad, Glenn. He is upset. And he has posted several videos on TikTok complaining that Rockstar Games, the creator of a video game, has stolen his likeness and they're profiting from his image. Um, He says, we got to talk, GTA. Wait a minute. Didn't he steal uh, the the, uh, Batman (laughs) franchise image in the first place? I'm I'm pretty sure. Well, listen, he is very serious about getting involved. He posted a TikTok video of like the there's some character in this game that looks just like him, which would in turn, if you go back, would look like Batman but or the Joker from the Batman tier. But whatever. He doesn't see that. He says, we got to talk, GTA. Or if not, you got to give me like a mil or two. <laughs> I don't think he's going to win in court, but like, I good know, luck. I don't, I don't <laughs> think so either. By the way, I look up tattoo models. It's a subset of alternative models. Tattoo models pose for photographs, perform videos, and appear in expos and live demos. They might appear in commercial shoots, tattoo marketing, tattoo product marketing, magazine photo shoots, runway shows, tattoo shop ads, and social media promotions. And they can make up to $400 an hour. Or they get their mugshot to go viral for nothing. Now, that Um, guy can never commit a crime because it's pretty easy to describe him to the artist, right? Uh, Unfortunately, Glenn, he did not heed that advice and has committed crimes. Um, (laughs) One time he was arrested for... uh, Aiming gun, a gun at passing vehicles. He was standing on the street aiming guns. Um, Why do I picture then, him doing that, actually? Yeah. yeah. And then they came to arrest him, and they were like, sir, do you have a gun? He's like, yeah, I got a gun, but I ain't got no permit because it's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's Grand Theft Auto, by the way, that he's Oh, yeah, he's yeah. He's going to win in that from. lawsuit. <laughs> The yeah, richest sure. game company in the world. Uh-huh. Yeah. No. yeah. Well, work. I learned something today about tattoo artists that I never knew before. Uh, probably you. I- I'm so excited. 
Did it say where he was in Florida? Because I want to avoid that street he's pointing the gun it, at. It says South Florida. I'm pretty oh, sure okay. just we should all just avoid South Florida. However, this next I have next to go down story, there to take the cruise next week to Fort Lauderdale. So Yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, the tattoo model guy is coming for you. Um, now, this next story, however, is in... <clears throat> Ocala. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Ocala, Florida, where Glenn lives, a competitor at a barrel racing event. Now, so many people send me this story, so I know I had to do it. So there's this lady at a, a barrel race in Ocala. Okay. And I guess she did not win. She then claims that she blacked out as a result of her being so upset at the result of her barrel race, and she didn't remember stealing things from another competitor. And what she stole is a saddle pad at the World Equestrian Center during the Fiddler's Turkey Run Barrel Racing Competition. The saddle pad was estimated to be worth $850. They have a lot more expensive saddle pads than we do. (laughs) Yeah. well, so I don't think Jennifer spent that for her three free saddle pads. No, no. if she did, you're going to have to have a chat with her. So here's the thing. She didn't remember because um, she blacked stealing. Out. She yeah. blacked out because she didn't win. And she didn't remember stealing. I, know I steal pad. things all the time when I black out. Well, she doesn't also remember cutting off the tags from the oh. saddle pad. Oh. And then while she had the saddle pad, she painted. Uh, there were some silver ends on the, the thing. And she decided to paint them black and cut off the tags. Mm. Um, so while she was under... She was pretty sneaky about stealing the patch. She did a lot while she was blacked out. I usually just lay there. I don't know. (laughs) All the times you black out from the time. Yeah, all those times I blacked out. Turkey run. (laughs) Um, By the way, she did that at the wrong place. They have their own police force there, and they don't put up with crap. Well, the victim originally was not planning to press charges, but after seeing the damage to the $850 saddle pad, she changed her mind. Mm. And they also ban you for life. She will never be set stepping foot on that property again. She ain't never going the turkey run again. Nope. All right. Nope. Last story. <laughs> if you're going to do that, don't do it at the World Equestrian Center. You're going to be shocked where this story is. Uh, gonna... Let me guess. Florida. Yeah, it's Florida. Yeah. Exactly. Southern Florida. Actually, oh, no, I was tricked. It's Disneyland. Oh, not California Disney finally. World. Yay, we get to leave yes. the state. We're going to go across Why the Why don't we have more California stories? There has to be tons of California stories. They, they protect their own. Yeah, I guess. I think so. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. You, Everybody knows the ride, It's a Small World. Right. It's a world. Oh, man, do the oh, world don't do not do that. That is my least favorite oh, ride. I hate that ride with a passion. Oh, I got to. I hate that ride. Alexa, play It's a Small World. No, no, no. You hey, can't do that. We'll get welcome. sued. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one like song I'm not getting sued for. <laughs> so there's the Small World ride at Disneyland. And God, that's a god awful ride. I would like Send to your hate s- mail to Jennifer Norris. I don't know what you're talking about. She I would like too. to say that there is no video of this. Um, however, it, there is video. There's, there's, there's all the video. On this. Okay, so let's say somebody's in the ride. It's say a boat ride. It's, it goes on the water. Yeah. It's a boat ride, in, it, but it's on tracks, and it's in yep. the water, and yep. it's in a building. Everybody knows the ride. There's creepy dolls the whole way through. Google it, and you'll see this video. Um, because there was, a, there was a kerfuffle in the small world ride, and it was paused. The ride was stopped. And the boats that, were stopped. That would be my damn luck. I'm on the oh, yeah. small, and that song is playing, and I'm sitting there for an hour. Well, it's do you know how it's do you know how long they have to know? Do you know how long they had to sit there? <laughs> I would kill myself. What? An hour and fifteen. Oh, I'm out. I'm, I'm swimming back to the. <laughs> an hour and fifteen. Oh minutes God! I would sue Disney for emotional damage. <laughs> yeah. Now, why, Glenn? Why did they have to stop the It's a Small World ride? Oh, please tell me well, somebody didn't defecate in the water. No, no, no. No, okay, no. Good. there wouldn't be video of that. Here's the shocking video on social media that shows a man walking around the attractions naked. Oh, That's there you right. go. Well, that would have made naked. the ride much more interesting than it usually is. 
Um, there is a there's clips of this man strolling around the attraction wearing just his glasses with a pile of clothes on the ground. And another clip, the man is seen taking a seat next to singing animatronic dolls as music plays near a faux Taj Mahal on the ride. <laughs> and then there's another clip of the Disney police that are chasing him going, stop, stop. You're just going to get hurt. Stop, stop. I need you to stop. Please just sit down. An- another place you don't want to fool around because they have their own police department. Another man uh, on Instagram uh, whose handle is I Heart Disneyland <laughs> wrote that the man got behind and pushed his boat while they were on the ride. Again, mind you, naked and also disturbing is there are there's not adults that take this ride. This is the ride with children. Uh, they did finally catch him. And what they did was they ended up having to have four security guards grab him two on the hands and two on the feet and carry him out like he's a dead body um, out yelling. People were yelling and screaming at him. And um, but he is um, they are saying that these clips are definitely not safe for work. I think they're hilarious. And I wish I could zoom in. It's never the good looking model dude that does this either. No, (laughs) I'm going to give you one guess on what his hairstyle was. Uh, One guess. Oh, it had to be a uh, what's that called? The hair's back. Um, A mullet. Mullet. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. He had a mullet. What were the conversations like with the parents and children after that ride? Uh, Hopefully they said drugs are bad. (laughs) Don't do drugs. (laughs) And there you go. And somebody did say it is a very small world after all. (laughs) That's the best line yet. Another good reason not to go on small world. Oh, people wait in line for an hour to go on that ride. And then Uh, in line, you hear the song the whole time. uh Oh, jeez. It's, again, Alexa, play it to small world. Go! You know, if uh, you, you know how they take people that have been captured in war and put them in and they make them listen to like ACDC 24 hours a day, you did it with Small World Me and I'd break in 10 minutes. I'd be like, yeah, what do you need <laughs> to know? I'll tell you everything. Here's my account <laughs> numbers. Take it all. <laughs> That's it for weird news. Thanks, everybody, for sending them in again. If you see a weird news story. Uh, send it to Jamie at horseradionetwork.com. I may not go over it all because some of you have very dirty um, stories that you appreciate sending me. And uh, I can't read them on the show, but I love reading them in my own brain. And this one had nudity and videos. So <laughs> thanks and, for that. And very large snakes. Large snakes, tiny wieners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. That's it for today. Thank you for joining us. Tomorrow will be the National Reining Horse Association episode. And then on Friday... We're playing our monthly trivia game with some of our auditors. Uh, We'll have some fun doing that. We'll also do some really bad ads. Get them into Jennifer at horseradionetwork.com. And then, Jamie, we have one more week of shows, and that's it for this year. I remember when we started this year. It was brand new. Uh, But, yeah, we have one more week, and then we're – I'm out to a cruise. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know if you're staying home or, you know, traveling, but uh, uh, I'm ready for a break. I think I'm I'm at that point. And today, I am, I, Glenn, would, I am putting the first ride. It's going to be first rider up for a little three year old filly that I've had in training. So oh good. that big day for me. And then just more of and travel more to of horses. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to Texas and a, a special shout out to one of our seriously awesome auditors, Angela Bailey. Um, she, is just as generous and kind as they come and cares about horses. And I just wanted to thank her. We don't need to go over what it was, but I just wanted to thank her for what she did. And she knows what that is. So love you, Angela. Auditors hang on and we'll, we'll do a little bit of an, a post show talking about what men should never say to women. We'll see if you agree. You've said them all. <laughs> Stay to your gelds. Are you pregnant? Oh my God. I'm going to punch him. <laughs> What does it do? <laughs>